performance art. And we're a partnership between Watershed, where we are right now, the University of the West of England, the University of Bristol, and we're funded by Arts Council England. And what we do is we offer studio space, desks, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free to our residents as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And we're a space for people to take risks with embryonic ideas and to make some time for collaboration. So a few notes before we start, please do feel free to move around, uh, head to the kitchen, make a cup of tea or coffee, grab a glass of water. Uh, we do have a quiet space uh, just to the, well, to my left, to your right. Uh, so if you need to take a break at any point, you can just pop around the corner and in there, it's soundproofed. You can, uh, you don't have to listen to us while you're in there. Uh, fire exits are at either end of the studio on the other end. If you hear a fire alarm, we have nothing planned, so that is probably real. Uh, the studio team will direct you towards the fire exits, but they are at the other end of the studio. Again, my left, your right, uh, at either end. And there are accessible toilets and baby change found in the corridor next to the kitchen, just over there. There will be a Q&A at the end of the talk. Uh, those of you who are watching online, if you can pop your questions into the YouTube chat, Danielle will be your voice in the room today. Uh, if you are in the building, uh, put your hand up. We will send a microphone around so that the folks at home can hear what you're saying. Uh, you can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio at mastodon.social on Mastodon, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. Right, our speaker for today is Brendan Arnold. Brendan is a creative technologist at the UK government's policy lab, a cross-government team work looking at how policy making might be done in five years time by working on real problems. He's going to talk about his experience working on naughty policy problems, using design thinking to bridge technical know-how making and policy making, and about how Policy Lab makes space for imagination and play in a line of work that can impact the lives of citizens. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Brendan. So thank you. Yep, I'm Brendan Arnold, uh, and I am a creative technologist in Policy Lab. I am a white male in my early 40s. I've got uh, grey jeans, uh, a jumper that looks a bit like TV static, and I've got um, a red hat um, to cap it off. Um, so before I start, I need to make a little bit of a disclaimer. This is a reflection of personal experience and not official positions of Policy Lab or of uh, government policy in general. Just have to get that out of the way just to make sure you know, we're kind of covered there. So I'm going to start with kind of a low ball question. Uh, what is policy? So it's not something that I was 100% clear on when I first joined the lab, but policy is more or less um, the kind of actions or the, sometimes the inactions that government takes um, to achieve certain outcomes. Um, now they can sort of range from you know, uh, legislation, which is what people most think of, uh, funding, um, we can be exemplars in practice, so a good example of that would be sort of like um, uh, the kind of uh, exemplar, exemplar farms. That, um, um, that where we might try out sort of new ideas, new crops and things like that, and then sort of propagate that to farmers so that they're not taking the risks on themselves. Um, and also it might be uh, being exemplars in how we do our, conduct our own uh, government departments, for example. So air bases might uh, take an initiative on environmental policies around the land that they own, for example. So along those lines. Anyway, it's not limited to that. There's also comms, there's... Um, other initiatives, encouraging uh, grassroots organisations, lots of stuff basically. So policy is a huge broad topic and, um, and it happens at all levels as well. So Policy Lab, we, um, we are a civil servant team. The way I talk, it might sound like we're a consultancy that come in, but we're not. We are uh, true blue blood civil servants. Um, we uh, work across government and we've been going now for about 10 years, so we are celebrating our uh, 10 year anniversary this year. So um, yeah, there might be some more celebrations and more outreach based on that. Um, so our mission is to radically improve policy making through design, innovation and people centred approaches. Um, so we really try to centre people in the process, the policy making process, and try to build that into our evidence base. Um, um, the lab is entirely self funded. Um, so we are kind of like an internal consultant like an internal consultancy, but as I say, we're civil servants. Um, there's about 30 of us, and uh, we have a really diverse set of skills. Um, uh, so we have people who are sort of um, uh, really sort of span this sort of spectrum of um, uh, skills, such as uh, designers. Um, we have artists. In fact, the head of lab is actually a practicing artist. 
Um, we've got uh, video ethnographers, and the first uh, video ethnographer in the UK government was from Policy Lab, as well as the first um, design policy designer as well, and the first creative technologist. So we like to think that we're really bringing in this sort of multidisciplinary approach uh, into policy making uh, to sort of give that kind of good mix of ideas. Um, since 2014, we've partnered with thousands of civil servants. We've done over 200 projects. And we've worked with departments which, um, you know, in central government primarily, but we've also worked with local government, and we've worked with arms length bodies. Uh, we haven't yet worked with Bristol Council, so if anyone out there is from Bristol Council, please let us know. But um, essentially, yeah, we work right the way, the full stack of sort of government, uh, right, right through to local government. Um, the teams we partner with, they own the policies, so for example, when we partner with uh, some policymakers, they will be the experts on you know, the particular area they're in. And we partner with um, people who are looking at job seekers, for example, fisheries management, child social care, lots of other ones. As I said, we've had 200 projects, lots of different things. And actually, at the end of the project, you become an expert yourself kind of thing after having worked with them for such a long time. But what we are really experts in is tools, methods, problem solving, and facilitating. So doing lots of this kind of stuff where we're kind of greasing the wheels a bit kind of thing, making things happen, involving people in the process and sort of making sure that everyone's on board and, um, uh, and things are working right. Um, the approach we take uh, can be broadly design, uh, described as sort of design, think, uh, a design approach. And by that we mean we're people-centered, so open, collaborative. We try to sort of involve people in the processes. Iterative, so always trying out things. You know, we always think that doing is better than sort of talking about sort of theorizing. Uh, and experimental, so trying things on a small scale before going big. And expansive, so we really, so another aspect of design thinking is sort of sometimes taking a step back, looking at the bigger picture, and perhaps there's other ways you can sort of approach a problem which you may not have thought of in the first place. And then once you've taken that expansive view, then really narrowing down on what you think is the right solution. So being expansive and then focusing again. So some of the core methods that we've worked with um, and we've kind of advocated and worked and built over the years and sort of introduced and championed um, are now taught as policy standards. So some of these, uh, for example, uh, user research, uh, stakeholder mapping, prototyping, challenge setting, co-design, systems thinking. So these are, these are all sort of methods that um, uh, really sort of involve people in the processes and again, encourage that expansive thinking and bring it back. But Part of our thing is this five-year look ahead. What are we going to be doing in five years' time? Um, and if anyone sort of pays attention to our blog, I mean, I don't expect you to have done, but in case you have, we released last year uh, a set of uh, cards. Now, these are our policy innovation cards. Um, and they kind of set out 11 areas and sort of, the, of, of, of uh, lines of inquiry that we want to be pursuing that might sort of serve as those north stars to sort of figure out where we might go next and sort of give us some some permission to sort of try these things out. And they range from all sorts of different things. So, you know, we've got them there, legislative theater. So there's some interesting work happening up in Manchester at the moment, uh, not from us, but you know, around this area um, with one of the people we collaborate with. Um, engaging through the metaverse. So, so many people now spend their times online. Wouldn't that be a great place to sort of meet people where they actually spend most, a lot of their time and sort of engage people in that arena. Um, art in policy, again, um, could artists help inform how policy is done? Um, we've run, um, and we've run a programme now for the past couple of years, which um, you know, happy to talk about uh, if you like afterwards. Decentralised autonomous organisations. Yeah, so <laughs> this is like a, a really techie thing, um, but uh, could we sort of use these sort of decentralised systems where there's real issues of trust? Um, and perhaps um, you know, government doesn't have to get involved in that kind of thing. Or perhaps we could and sort of got, you know, help set those things up, right, and sort of give them a little bit of credence because trust has always been an issue with those kind of systems. So this goes to how does a creative technologist fit into all of this? Um, and I've sort of drawn these sort of circles here about some of the skills that um, a creative technologist, or, or rather I've found in my role, have been sort of really crucial to sort of pick up and uh, understand and really get to grips with. Um, and this might be different to how creative technologists kind of work in the arts, um, but they're sort of really, this is how it works in my role anyway. So yeah, there's design thinking and prototyping, which we've talked about. 
um, facilitation and collaboration, so an awful lot of workshopping, talking with people, a lot of people-centered work, really sort of, you know, again, sort of making sure that you're able to, to do those kind of face-to-face -face things, which sometimes technologists don't necessarily have the right skill set to do. Um, project lead, so, you know, being able to manage projects, being able to see across projects, you know, sort of join dots, things like that. And then a massive part of that, which is probably sort of like the USP for a technologist, is sort of technical know-how. Um, now, this is a project that um, uh, uh, some of the team worked on for, for where we, they spoke to refugees. They wanted to understand uh, how um, they were being uh, delivered the English learning um, uh, training and sort of like, how do they learn English language? Um, and, and can we improve that? Now, often this work we, that we do is through uh, lived experience research. We go and talk to people. Now, obviously, if someone's not sort of an English language speaker, um, you know, you have to do that through an interpreter, and there's always this sort of like slight disconnect there kind of thing. So what the team did is they created this toolkit, which lets people um, map out their experience, you know, spatially, you know, put down their kind of map their journey, talk about it, and then sort of really sort of have a point of reference, you know, which they can work from. Um, and um, yeah, it was a, and this was done by one of our um, design placements. Um, who, who used uh, rapid prototyping techniques, you know, things like laser, laser etching, um, uh, and also the team sort of built these 3D printed sort of models and things like that. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, they kind of, and then put together this kit that then the home office could take away and then use to engage with people who don't have English as a first language. Um, the second thing uh, I wanted to just highlight here was, um, this is kind of like live AI generation. So a bit like live coding, you know, if you've been to a music event and people sort of like put visuals up in real time, this one was using sort of AI generative tools to illustrate people's ideas, you know, in real time during a talk. Now this was done by, again, by actually a, um, an artist who's sort of working with us at the moment, um, who's on placement. And, um, and he was able, and he's, work, he's looking at AI as kind of like one of his medium and, um, and he sort of, this was one of the ways that he thought about using it in the um, policy context. Um, but the point I wanted to make here is, is these are sort of skills that traditionally would have been a creative technologist kind of like, uh, kind of realm, I guess, you know, the kind of things that creative technologists would have done. Um, but now they're becoming much more accessible. So design courses, you know, teach this sort of rapid prototyping. Artists now get into AI, you know, it's sort of like, it's sort of, it sort of asks the question, you know, what does, a creative technologist bring as a unique sort of thing to a team. So, oh yeah, and this is another example of, um, you know, some of these sort of live coding. So, um, yeah, as the person was talking, they would sort of like see fresh images come up on the screen. So, um, so it's led me to sort of lean a little bit more into the deep technical know-how. So things are going to get a little bit technological kind of thing, but um, it sort of uh, tends to be those kind of things which look at sort of the digital, the building, the sort of like um, as well as sort of, um, so that's sort of web-based things, you know, sort of like um, software, apps, things like that. And then also, I haven't had the opportunity to do this yet, but I'm kind of hoping it might be about sort of building bits of hardware and things like that. We'll see where things go. Um, so in thinking about this talk, I kind of reflected on some areas that uh, actually I was able to sort of bring some of those digital skills to bear. Um, and, um, and these were just some sort of things that actually, you know, I will speak to later on. Um, but things like, you know, can people take online, take part in the workshops? So we do lots of in-line, in uh, sorry, in-person workshops. Um, you know, we use like real tools. You know, we've seen there we've got those kind of like, um, uh, you know, we make you know, counters, tokens, lots of post-it notes, all sorts of stuff like that, right? Do we, um, can we actually sort of bring that into a hybrid space? Because always we get asked, you know, we've got some people who can't make it, can they take part? You know, when we increasingly live in this sort of world where lots of stuff is done through teams and things like that. Um, can we test this idea with, we need to test this idea with more people, essentially. So uh, lived experience research, so that's where the video ethnographers will go out and they'll shadow a person in their sort of daily lives and sort of make kind of almost like documentaries about their lives that we should then play back and use as evidence. Now we can't really scale that. That's not something that's possible to do with a large sample of people. You know, we can perhaps do you know a dozen people, something like that. You know, we have to really sort of bear in mind the fact that we're bringing value to. We want to you know deliver taxpayer value and things like this, right? 
So can we sort of um, test those kind of findings out with larger groups of people? Um, next one, uh, can we just see the numbers for the Southwest? So this is a classic sort of data analyst problem. We don't, we, we, we do have a little bit of data analyst skills, but this is just an example of something where I was able to help out. But um, yeah, uh, again, if you can do that kind of stuff, it's always useful. Um, it would be great if others could hear this audio testimony. So again, lived experience research, you know, what we deliver at the end of the day tends to be a paper report or an, a written report. Wouldn't it be great if like someone who was a decision maker or somebody else could actually hear the sort of real voices of people? And I'll talk a bit later about how we managed to do that. And uh, could we engage with civic tech groups? So there's an awful lot of energy um, around at the moment. People want to help out. They want to sort of change things and sort of, you know, I think there's, there is a slight movement to sort of like be re-engaged with civic society. Uh, and we often get sort of approached by um, sort of NGOs, by individuals um, and uh, people who just have a good, you know, a bit of a moral compass who want to sort of help out and want to sort of work with us. Um, and so, um, and sort of use their um, tech skills. But it's not really clear how we do that, right? And then the last question, what even is a DAO? So that's the decentralized autonomous organization I mentioned earlier. You know, having this sort of deep tech know-how helps you answer those questions and sort of explain that back to people and sort of like, like properly understand about what, we're, what it is we're trying to achieve. So with that lens, I'd like to talk about three digital prototypes that we've made, that I've made over the past um, of my time in government. Uh, the first one is a prototype for deliberation. The second one is a prototype for evidence collation and review. And the third one's interactive evidence and reports. So the deliberation prototype, this is built around a system which was kind of well known um, called Poll.is, um, which is a system that's been used in lots of places and lots of governments now. For example, Taiwan have used it um, as part of their kind of um, their new way of uh, working with digital. Uh, they have this whole new government department about digital and things, and um, they use Polis as, as a platform to do that. Uh, essentially what it is, it's a way to, uh, to reach out to lots of different people. They put their ideas into one big pot and then they basically get to vote on each other's ideas. So it's a bit like, um, uh, uh, so, so it's a bit like a virtual suggestion box, but you also get to test those ideas back again. Um, and the nice thing, and the thing that this offers over, um, say like a survey or a questionnaire or something like that is, you know, we're asking the questions in that, and it's a very top-down kind of thing. There may be things we just hadn't dreamt of kind of thing that we want to actually include and in, uh, that other people will have. And, they're, you know, they kind of, once they get the questionnaire, they're kind of wishing, oh, if only there was something in here I could talk to about this, that, and the other. So it's a way to engage a lot of people, and it generates lots of data, which is sort of, um, which can be sort of analysed. Um, it draws out consensus. It collects those new ideas. We can use it to test assumptions we might have. And another thing it does, it identifies groups. So we, co we collect this with wraparound services that we have, uh, which include things like moderation and um, uh, uh, an onboarding questionnaire, for example. We sort of bring that together. And um, we like to think that we get a good sense about what, where people are at, where the energy is at, you know, in a particular population. Uh, and um, you know, we can sort of bring that back to the policymakers uh, for them to make their decisions. The next thing, next prototype, is the evidence collation and review. So there's loads and loads of um, different sources of evidence. So when you're working in a policy area, um, you know, you'll have, you'll have experts, you'll have um, uh, think tanks, you'll have, um, you'll have the, you know, people who are sort of in the industry, people that the policy affects. Um, you'll have your own research you've done, so the lived experience research I mentioned earlier, surveys, questionnaires, consultations, tons of stuff, basically. and. Uh, big part of our job is taking that evidence and making it digestible because people are coming into government all the time. Different people need to be brought up to the same baseline of kind of knowledge and thinking. So one way that we do this is we kind of distill these, all those bits of evidence into sort of, um, into these kind of bite-sized chunks that we call evidence cards and they're a bit like flashcards. Uh, and we present them back to people in a way that's kind of takes cues from art galleries. So we'll put them around the room, they're spatially organized. People can go around with somebody else. Um, they can sort of discuss, discuss, you know, discuss the particular bit of evidence because it's quite uh, tactile. They can sort of put like, stick, stickies on there if they don't agree with it or something like that. 
um, so that's, which forms part of the review process. Um, it also means that they can um, identify gaps in the evidence as well. So if there's something we're missing, they might be able to, we often leave blank cards out, and people can write down their own sort of bit, stick it on there. So we've developed a tool that helps us gather that and generate these cards. It also has sort of an AI element to generate a bit of sort of mood imagery around it as well. Um, but as we're going to discuss later, we think there are other things we could do. We could sort of bring this online. We could sort of make it much more like an art gallery style experience to bring people up to speed with evidence. And, um, and we'll see why in a bit. And the final one is one about interactive reports. Uh, and again, different ways of uh, combining and recombining evidence as well. So again, this is from a project that we worked on. Yeah, I should say, actually, all of these prototypes come from projects because we're project led. Um, we kind of have to hook that onto a project. We don't get time to just sit and write what we think, you know, write the code out for whatever we think is the right thing to do. We have to hook it onto a project, and that means it's driven by commissioners. So um, we have these interactive report. Uh, yeah, we, we, had a, we had a project with a particularly large amount of evidence, uh, and the evidence was also live and incoming as we were sort of doing the project. So it was continually updating. Um, it had rich multimedia, there was lots of lived experience research in there. It had lots of um, uh, testimony accounts, lots of academic stuff, so you know, charts and graphs and things like that. So we created this kind of evidence base, um, because as well, oh, it's also from different departments. So one thing about government working is a lot of departments work kind of in their own realms kind of thing, and there's not a lot of cross deliberation. It's a situation that is getting better. And we're hoping sort of things like this will help out with that. But like, um, it, we, we put all this evidence from across government into one place. Um, and then you're able to cut it in lots of different ways. You know, you could look at a map and sort of see if there's like a spatial element to the evidence. Um, you could look at um, uh, themes. So we've drawn out some like overarching themes around this and um, look at it in that sort of particular lens. And we also um, played it back, you know, based on sort of um, the kinds of evidence and things like that. So different ways of categorizing things, different ways of chopping and changing. And it meant you could create a playlist of like all the kind of bits of evidence which have been sort of broken apart. You reassemble them in a particular way to tell a particular story. Uh, and we did it and we presented it back in this sort of really nice magazine style layout kind of thing. So I don't know if you've seen some of those sort of infographic journalist pieces kind of thing where you kind of scroll and things fly in and all that kind of stuff, right? We did, we did it in that kind of way because we wanted to make it a joy to consume. You know, sort of people, you know, people are sort of probably a little bit sick of um, really sort of dry government reports that are kind of just words and nothing else, right? So we wanted to sort of play things back in a way that's, that's a bit more with the times and sort of like, um, you know, reflects current practice in, say, journalism and things like that. So, so this was a great way to kind of play that evidence back again. Now... Uh, just want to introduce here the Collective Intelligence Lab, which is going to sort of tie together those three bits of um, um, those three bits, uh, three prototypes. So the Collective Intelligence Lab is uh, is an initiative that we run inside of Policy Lab. It's me and a guy called Pratik Butch, who's um, kind of the co uh, co runner <laughs> of the, of this um, Collective Intelligence Lab. And uh, broadly speaking, our kind of goal that we want to do is to create a Digital Citizen Assembly, which is one of the sort of policy cards, one of those policy innovation cards you saw earlier. I'm just a bit curious, actually. Does anyone know what citizen assemblies are? I mean, just show, show a hands kind of thing. OK, so it's about half the room. Does anyone feel like they could explain it back to the rest of the crowd? Take a broad stab at it kind of thing? Anyone? I'm going to have a go. Go on, then. I think it is sort of mini, almost a mini parliament. So you draw from a pool of interested citizens or representative groups and you bring people together and facilitate a conversation around a particular topic. And then those people or groups continue to be interested, uh, to, to be involved in, on an ongoing basis if they choose to. Yes. How wrong was I? That's, that's brilliant. Oh, so, okay. yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> So, so ex exactly like it's a mini parliament, and as you said, it's sort of a random selection of the population. Um, they've been doing this a lot in Ireland, actually. So, um, you know, some some of the issues which are perhaps you know difficult issues, things like reproductive rights, things like that, 
They've, um, whether it's kind of contentious and you know, very emotive kind of thing, they've brought people in, you know, a group of 100 people from across the country and done exactly that. You know, they get to talk, hear evidence from experts, a bit like a kind of a, a, a jury kind of thing, you know. Uh, and then they get to sort of think about, deliberate over it, talk with each other, and then they sort of come up with an ideas for policy um, that hopefully will, inf well, will inform policy and, um, and form a basis for the kind of the next steps, basically. So that's what the Citizen Assembly is, and we wanted to do an online version of that, right? So if I sort of plot out what a really lo-fi policy development cycle looks like, you know, people get together, they deliberate over policy after considering evidence, right? Uh, they might deliberate how it's going to get delivered. So, you know, now we know what we want to do, how do we do it? You know, what, what kind of nitty-gritty details need to be put into place to sort of like make that happen? Uh, come up with a delivery plan um, and then sort of publish that. Assess the outcomes. So after running a pilot, you know, on a small scale, um, does it work? Assess what happens. And then once you've assessed that, feed it back into the deliberation process for a second time if it needs to go, if it, that's what needs to happen, you know? Um, so if we look at each one of our prototypes, those prototypes kind of, you know, if you sort of squint a bit, they kind of map to these different areas, right? So what we are hoping is that we can take these prototypes, which were developed in isolation, uh, and we're hoping that we, because they're prototypes, they're amenable to sort of change and adapting and things like that. We're hoping we can sort of slightly, we can join them together to sort of create this kind of policy cycle. And we're gonna end up in the end with something along the lines of a digital citizen assembly. Um, now, it's probably, now, I just wanna manage expectations. This is an aspiration that we have, but it's the kind of direction that we're going in kind of thing. And what we want to do with the kind of, um, uh, you know, with the uh, collective intelligence lab and the way it's going. And so uh, we're testing out all these different bits in isolation, we're bringing them together, and um, we're hoping that it's gonna have this kind of, you know, approach where we can really involve citizens in how policy is made. Now we spoke a bit about um, civic tech groups. So at the moment it's just myself who's the kind of digital person, you know, who actually has these sort of digital skills and things. And I've spoken about how there's so much energy in the sort of civic tech groups, you know, so to achieve this kind of like this policy cycle thing, you know, and this digital citizen assembly, we would, you know, we would love to find a way to work with these sort of open civic tech groups kind of thing, you know, uh, and to do this. So a lot of uh, last year I was going to, this was um, in Bethnal Green, there's a place called New Speak House. And in uh, New Speak House, there is a, uh, a regular meetup of hackers who sort of like are really into these kind of problems. And, um, you know, you kind of speak to them, you get together, you kind of work on stuff. It's really great energy. But, um, but it's also very anarchic kind of thing. People do what they're interested in, right? So you might have an idea about what you want to do with the, with the, with the prototype. Someone else wants to do something else. And it can be quite tricky to sort of work in a single direction. And if anyone's done community management before or worked with communities, it's very, very difficult to sort of, um, it takes a lot of energy. So if we were to sort of put our own events on, for example, and sort of have our own community that we manage ourselves, it's quite tricky to, it takes a lot of energy. And like I said, I'm an individual, I'm working on lots of projects at the same time. I really want to sort of focus on what I'm good at and sort of not do tons of other stuff, right? So one of the models that we've come up with, and again, this is a possible way of working uh, and aspiration, is rather than trying to get everyone to sort of work on the same code base and to build on top of the same things, especially when those things aren't quite aligned, which inevitably leads to more complexity, we was hoping that we could provide a foundation. So one of these prototypes, we would love to sort of give people a kind of a core to work with and make that core really easy to adapt to people's needs. Um, so, you know, if they want to try out putting a new button on the interface or they want to do a, or they want to just try out an entirely different approach, then they can do that approach, nothing to do with us. They can take our code, they can use our code. But what we would like them to do is uh, to, to just tell us what happened. So a bit like a kind of an open source license where you ask to contribute code back, instead it's contribute the learnings back. So this is kind of an idea that we would really like to sort of encourage and try out. So again, it's another prototype. It's another thing that we want, that we think is really important because we're prototyping, what's important is the learnings. It's not necessarily the code. The code itself is kind of, to some degree, could be rewritten any day, right? You know, it could end up being turned into a full public service, who knows, right? So, 
So I've kind of talked a lot about technology and I realize it's the creative crowd. So I'm going to talk a bit about the creative bit. So there is a sense of how can we make space for imagination in the civil service? Um, so we are, it's, civil service you know, has a lot of things attached to it in terms of its imagery and things like that. But I want to make it clear, the people in the civil service are incredibly innovative, very creative. They work with incredible constraints. They really sort of work hard to deliver value for money. And they work to tight schedules as well. Um, there's an awful lot of public scrutiny as well to the civil service. So if we do things, I mean, this talk itself is a bit of a risk, you know, by sort of doing this. I had to sort of pass this by my, my heads to make sure there wasn't stuff. And they took out a lot. <laughs> and so there's lots of things that we couldn't talk about kind of thing, you know. But, um, uh, but it's, it's important to sort of have in mind the optics about how this looks, you know, because this is taxpayer money. Uh, and I also want to make it clear that, you know, in our sort of normal roles, we do get a lot of chance for innovation. So once we're doing our sort of project work, we do get to work on lots of innovative things. You know, we're partnered with Makerversity. We can go there, we can use their facilities, we can make stuff, prototype, that kind of thing. And during the projects, we've had chances to do lots of cool stuff. So um, you can see there's lots of interesting bits and pieces, you know, bits of um, making patches, embroidery, uh, kind of bringing just collecting samples like an explorer kind of thing and then bringing them to civil servants to understand a place better. Um, you know, um, working with artists. So this is the manifest project um, that's going on right now in Sheffield. So you've got to Sheffield, there's an art exhibition, which is um, artists that have worked with civil service uh, um, in real projects. So I just want to make clear that, you know, we do get that chance, but it often happens in those sort of, in those kind of, to a tight deadline, lots of pressure, um, you know, and sometimes we can take the less risky option because, you know, it's like we need to deliver um, taxpayers' money, so on. So, myself and, and another co-conspirator, Alex Fleming, um, we set up um, this fortnightly imagination forum that we kind of have in our uh, policy lab. And this is a safe space for designers and non-designers to experiment through doing. So it really emphasizes, we want to actually be doing stuff. We don't want to be talking about things. Um, we um, want to uh, make it so that it's not necessarily, you, you, there are no expectations in terms of um, outcomes and outputs and things like that. It's kind of just trying stuff out and sort of seeing where it goes. Uh, this is one of the sessions, unfortunately we don't have a lot of pictures of the things because you tend to be doing things. So, um, and, but I promise you, it's not just computers, right? You know, we do try and where possible to bring in sort of real stuff, you know, making, doing, things like that. Um, so yeah, it sort of gives us a bit of an artistic license to sort of do these things. Um, we can build, explore, and take risks. And it's a really great sort of like forming ground for those new methods. So when we're kind of thinking about those policy cards and we want to try out a new idea, this is a great place to try things out in the first instance without it being on some commissioner's uh, payroll, uh, so we're not using up their time. We're kind of trying out ourselves. Yeah, and as I said, it's all about doing. Uh, a lot of it is about learning something from peers. So we've had people who basically um, have uh, gone away. They've done a course or something like that, and they want to come back and they want to share what they've learned with us. So you know, we had someone who did uh, some scribe area stuff, how to draw, things like that, how to draw to convey information. We had someone else who went away and did forum theatre and they came back and sort of talked to, through with us how to uh, use kind of theatre techniques to sort of work um, uh, and facilitate workshops and things like that. Um, or, yeah. Um, we then also sort of like um, use this to explore the boundaries of our tools, uh, of our work environment and beyond. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, and it's also a nurturing experience. So, you know, things like well-being, things like that often get forgotten in these kind of high pressure, fast paced environments. Um, we have a, um, and, and so this kind of provides that fire break in your day. So let's say you, you're working on a busy project. One of our sort of, we ran a retrospective recently to sort of see why pe what, what people got from this. And uh, one of the things that someone said was, you know, they were kind of really stuck on a problem. And they got the chance to take a break. And then when they came back to that problem, it was kind of freed up because they'd kind of gone to this other world for a bit and come back again. Um, it's also a shared team experience. So we are 30 people, but we all work in lots of different groups on different projects, lots of stuff happening in parallel. So this is a, a, a chance for us all to get together, including with people like our finance people who perhaps you don't talk to that much. 
um, for example. And um, it's not recorded. We only really take notes if there is, a, you know, post post session. Uh, if with something really interesting we want to follow up on something like that. And it gives us, yeah, like I said, it gives us that permission. It exercises our mandate. We are an innovation team. You know, we want to sort of prove. You know, we want to, we want to actually be innovative and do stuff. Uh, builds creative confidence for a lot of our non-designers. Um, it was, and again, something from the retro was a lot of our non-designers. They sort of felt um, that when there was kind of a goal in the end, they didn't feel they like could creatively contribute. So uh, those people, you know, really find this valuable um, by not having those kind of expectations. And it equips us with experience and practice. So if we are going to be talking about these things, trying to sort of sell them to the wider civil service, we need to have actually done some things and know about them and sort of be able to talk to them. Um, so I'm just going to go through some examples of the things we've done. Uh, this one, oh, why is it massive? OK, well, you can't see at the bottom, but the attribution here is um, this is actually based on a tool called the Quiet Year. And it's, um, I forget the name of the people who did it. It's beyond, if you search for the quiet year on the internet, you'll find it. But it's um, a tabletop role playing game where you role play as a community. And uh, I mean, in the game, it's a post apocalyptic community. <laughs> but what we did is we were looking at ways that we could adapt this to uh, policy context. Um, although we started out playing the game as is, right? So, um, so as a team, you go around the table. And you have a deck of cards. There's 52 cards, 52 weeks in the year. That's why it's called the quiet year. And each card is a week. You turn it over, and the card represents some scenario, some event. Now, you can tailor this to a policy context. You know, so you know, let's say you're doing work on, I don't know, uh, windmills out in the North Sea or something like that kind of thing. You know, the event is there's a, there's a once in 100 year storm. You know, how do we respond, right? You know, and the people around the table who are, and we, you know, in our session, we just do it with the people around the table. But you know, the idea is in the policy context, we would have experts, and they would sort of talk to that, right? And there's lots of mechanics in that game, which are also interesting that you might want to sort of bring in, um, you know, as well. This one's about uh, redactive reframing. See, this is the right size. Um, so this one is uh, based on uh, some redactive poetry by someone called Kate Bear. Now, what she did is she she had a load of online. So she was a well-known poet. She had a load of like, um, but then she had loads of like awful stuff posted on Twitter. And what she did is she took all that stuff and she sort of wrote it all out. And then she deleted stuff until the message changed and she had a whole new message basically that kind of reframed what that was about. Um, and it kind of basically switched it around, flipped it on its head. Uh, and so we wanted to try something out. You know, there's lots of documentation, lots of documents and things in policy. Could we sort of use that to sort of find new meanings in that document, in those documents and try and just, see what happened. Now, I'm still trying to figure out how this actually goes into policy. But like I said, this is a space for experimentation, right? And what we did find is you can really distill a document down to its absolute core, kind of almost like baby talk kind of words kind of thing, and still convey the same stuff. So this took a, this took a Bristol cable newspaper. Um, oh, actually, well, the other thing you can do is you can completely change the meaning. And so this one did change the meaning. But you can also sort of take it down to, you know, a quarter of the words and still understand what's going on. Uh, the next one is games in sheets. So this one was, um, uh, so we're talking about sort of how we're using our tools. Now, as a civil servant, you work in sort of uh, hot desk offices, or we do now. Um, and that means you don't really have a lot to play with, right? So, but one of the things you do have is you have, you know, Office, <laughs> right? So, um, or Microsoft Office. Well, this one was actually Google Sheets, but, um, but yeah. We're using the co-editing feature you know, when you can see people's icons flying around as you're working on it. And we were figuring out how could we uh, create sort of mini games in that. And so we went around the table, and each of us came up with mini games, a bit like WarioWare kind of thing. And sort of like, um, we we're just really sort of pushing the, the things that you could do with sheets. And so you end up, yeah, and then we ended up with this amazing looking document with kind of puppies in it. Uh, we had sort of Olympic style races where you had to fill in as many cells as you could with trivia. Um, all sorts of other stuff. So it's like it's quite a fun thing to do, uh, and it kind of. And we're hoping this. You know, again, we don't really know what the goal of this is. Um, maybe it will make us better to cope in a workshop where it turns out that your whiteboard tool doesn't work or whatever. You know, you can try something else, but we don't really know, right? The idea is it's a place to experiment, and it's not always about getting goals at the end. 
And last example is uh, the metaverse. Now, this is one where we kind of went on to Mozilla Hubs, and I understand that you know it's not the state of the art kind of thing, but it doesn't really matter. In in our world, it's about what's accessible and what we can use, right? And so we went in and we've tried some things out. And this is and we think that the metaverse is super important because lots of people now are spending time online in video games, um, you know, hours and hours a day kind of thing. And our ethnographers are especially interested in this, you know, uh, how can we sort of reach people in those worlds? And before we can do that, we need to have some understanding of it and how they work. Now, we know that not everyone is in Mozilla Hubs, but it gives us a sense about what, how these spaces might work, how we can reach people, you know, across the country, you know, from the City Islands to the Shetlands, right? Um, you know, increase the access to that, those kind of spaces, things like that. So in terms of learnings, I would say that quite often in these sessions, there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between well-being and problem solving. So, and we try to sort of steer towards the well-being side because it's not really about solving problems, but often that happens, right? Um, and like I said, you know, we had people who sort of like, who want to sort of treat this as kind of like a bit of a fire break in the day, right? So we make, uh, it's entirely optional if you attend, although one telling thing is even in our busiest periods, people still make the hour in the day to come along to these sessions and sort of attend them. Um, spectators are allowed, you don't have to take part, you can just watch and see what happens, bring your lunch. Uh, Co-organised, if you are going to run something like this, um, I would really recommend you have a co-conspirator. So Alex Fleming, I work with, uh, and she's really, really creative. Um, she helps sort of diversify the kinds of activities that we do. So I like certain things, she likes certain things. Kind of between us, we cover a really good space. Um, you can cover for each other. And as well, just those idea generations, the amount of times, you know, we're sort of like, it's the day before. It's, oh, we've got a session tomorrow, what are we gonna do? Uh, and then we just sort of like have a call and we'll have something sorted by the end of it. It's really good. So, um, yeah, and I would say sort of, you know, be slightly agile and sort of revisit the schedule and the format. We've been running these sessions, an hour long sessions every two weeks. Um, but uh, we'd really like to try perhaps doing it less frequently, but for longer. And perhaps we can do things like go outside or go to a space in the make university or do something like that. And it kind of opens up that space into sort of a much bigger area. Uh, right, and so in that spirit, we, um, in the last imagination um, forum, we actually came up with an exercise for you guys. So this is gonna be a five minute exercise followed by a little deliberation, which will then lead into the questions. Um, but basically it's about a futures thinking thing. It's based on a futures thinking tool by Stuart Candy, if you search for his name on the web. He does lots of really cool stuff. His thing is way more, way better than this. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, you know, this is a way to sort of think about uh, an imagined future. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take four prompts. Um, the first prompt's gonna be a setting. Second one's gonna be a government department, a central government department. Third one's gonna be an object. Fourth one's gonna be an emotion. And, we'll, and I'll tell you in a minute how these prompts come about. And then you're going to come up with an imagined future. I think if you group up into maybe threes, actually, so if you, everyone group up into threes in the room, people online can do this as well. Um, although you'll have to work alone, I'm afraid. Um, and what you do is you take the prompts I'm just about to give you, and then you come up with an imagined future that addresses those four prompts. And the imagined future will sort of relate to the role of central government in the arts. So if you have a bit of discussion, hopefully you can do that. So if you deliberate over this for five to seven minutes, so here are the prompts that we came up with in the session. And the way that you get your prompts is you take the last four digits of a phone number, uh, your phone number, someone else's phone number, whoever's, and you choose this. And so let's say these last four digits are like uh, one, two, three, four, right? Uh, the setting would be the year is 11, it's after Common Era. The department is the Department of Joy. The object is tortoise shell glasses and uh, the mood is shock. So does that make sense for everyone? Don't understand that. So if you get, sorry, question there. So uh, taking those four prompts, uh, what you do is you try to think of an imagined future, and so it might be sort of like just a few sentences that describe this imagined future in a scenario that kind of incorporate those prompts. Don't worry too much. I mean, it can be fantastical, just not, it doesn't have to make sense really kind of thing, you know, but the idea is to sort of generate these ideas. So let's talk about design thinking. This is, this is an exercise we do to sort of go big with your ideas before another exercise would make, would make sense of them. 
so it's a bit of a fun kind of uh, thing to do. So we just spend five minutes doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you three, just do that for a bit.
Um, hello? Hello? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so there's lots of really great chatter there. And um, uh, yeah, and I think what we might do is we might sort of go popcorn style. So if anyone's like really bursting to talk about what they want to talk about, uh, they can go first. Um, I will just say I was taking a couple of photos of there. So if anyone is not happy with me having fo photos, please let me know. And uh, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to go right now, kind of thing, uh, and tell us a little bit about your imagined future. Um, and yeah, I also would like to ask that you don't make it sort of like against individuals, kind of thing, you know, who might, may or may not be in government, kind of thing, you know, it would be good. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, who, who would like to go first? And this includes people online as well. So if anyone wants to type in the chat, you know, what they found. For the setting, we got confused. Um, for the future government department, we got the Department of Joy. Um, for our object, we got pipe. And for our mood, we got giddiness. So we decided that the role of central government in the arts um, would be that the, the funding pipeline would be purely focused on um, what brings people joy uh, in terms of what we fund in terms of the arts, um, which uh, we thought would probably, in terms of the confusion, make anyone who's worked in the arts for a long time feel slightly confused. <laughs> Stone. Uh, so anyone have any comments on that? Or, um, I, I mean, what do you think the impact of that might be, you know, if we did focus purely on joy? What, what would happen to you know, other parts of art funding and things? Discrimination towards talent. Discriminate, yeah, exactly, yeah. So what about those people who sort of like, yeah, it, it, it's sort of like mental health often is about acknowledging, you know, those kind of the spectrum of kind of emotions and things like that, right? So if we focused on joy, what, what could happen, you know? What's that? Would, would anyone file their taxes on time if we only focused on joy? <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, it would be almost a crime, wouldn't it? Tax, you know, filling in taxes, right? So, uh, did, did anyone else have uh, an idea they wanted to sort of put forward or scenario? Futures, yeah. Right. So we had actually slightly less uh, happy one. We had uh, 9732, which we had the climate crisis, uh, Ministry for Refugees. <laughs> tortoiseshell glasses and disorientation. Um, so we were thinking, uh, with if being a refugee, you're often having to kind of land in a new place. You're often quite nomadic. You might not really have any choice about where you've ended up because of climate change. Um, and, we, and we were like, OK, the glasses, how on earth are we going to like use these tortoiseshell glasses? So I was thinking about like um, augmented reality. And now uh, things like, you know, Google Translate, uh, you, um, I used it quite a lot when I went on holiday. You know, you can hover over menus and translate the text. Uh, you can use uh, um, in Google Maps. This isn't, I, I don't work for Google. I'm also in government. Um, you can, um, like, hover around your surroundings and use it to navigate. And nowadays, like, you know, you can pull a lot of information together. You know, you can down, like, put all of gov.uk in uh, and all the information that might be useful for someone in a new setting. And then these kind of glasses will help you kind of uh, settle into your new environment, give you all the resources that you might need to help you um, kind of integrate into a new community, understand like, um, I don't know, the weather in Finland or the UK and like different cultural practices and food and like all of those kinds of things, um, yeah. So that's how, you know, we, we thought glasses, like what we're going to do with them. But, you know, it's, uh, does anyone want to say anything? Covered it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, amazing. Brilliant. So, yeah, absolutely. Sort of new tech, how that might sort of affect things um, and how we might use that, you know, I think it's really important to consider. I am slightly aware of time, actually. We've got like four minutes. So, uh, yeah, if there are any sort of general questions, just want to open the floor up to that um, on what I've sort of shown today or any other questions. Policy Lab, about what we're doing, creative technology. Silence. I mean, we can carry on talking about imagined futures, if you like, you know, what you chatted about. Um, not imagined futures. 
just a question about like politics in general. Is the aim almost to be apolitical, where you're not aligned to like any one political party or the other? I'm pretty ignorant of this kind of thing. So, so the civil service, we kind of live by the civil service code, which sounds quite sort of almost like samurai code or something like that, right? You know, but basically, it's, it means that um, you know we can't sort of show allegiances publicly. So you know, when we're sort of on Twitter, things like that. You know, when I'm on talks like this, a public talk. You know, I can't sort of put anything, I can't put anything out there that would jeopardize my ability to work with, um, you know, people of any color mm. kind of thing, you know. So like, um, uh, yeah, it's that kind of thing where, uh, yeah, you have to be quite careful as a civil servant. Um, and again, it sort of comes back to those optics and things like that. Uh, the plus side of that is it sort of, uh, it means that, you know, providing you follow that code, you know, and you're kind of, um, you know, some of the sort of problems and things, you know, are kind of managed for you kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. So provided you play by the rules, it's okay. Um, no, no, sorry, I had a follow-up still waiting. No. Hello. Um, so, so this sounds like a kind of very liberal arts approach to policy, policy making, and kind of, you know, traditionally policy is very sort of top-down and regimented. And, mm -hmm. um, do, do you find you come up against a lot of friction between kind of older ways of doing this and, and kind of these innovative, newer ways. Yeah, so it's a funny kind of thing that because people come to us, um, they tend to be in the right mindset. Now, no doubt there are parts of the civil service that you know we probably should be sort of reaching into, and we are trying to. Some of the some of the departments are more sort of traditional than others, uh, and we would like to sort of work with them more. And we are sort of making inroads. Uh, and also, some departments they have their own policy labs who kind of like perhaps more closely aligned with their culture. But also bring some of these methods, techniques in, um, to, you know, in that kind of space. So yes, there is a lot of tradition and kind of that kind of stuff does go on. But in my role, I haven't seen a lot of it just because of kind of the kind of the bias that I have, kind of thing. Because I'm sort of working within that sphere, you know, and I only see people who are already wanting to do that kind of thing. One specific question. Um, so there was one part where you mentioned about having um, like a really interactive way of reporting like outcomes. I mean, it was, you said it was like a magazine style um, report type thing. Um, with that one project, like how was that received? And in terms of delivering that, did you still have to do like a, a written word report as part of that? Or is mm. that, do you see that slowly becoming like a new way of actually widely accepted? I mean, so, so first of all, I can't talk about the project because it's not public yet, so um, in particular. But in that particular project, we didn't re do a report. No, um, we kind of, uh, because not every project we do kind of sit, you know, covers the full cycle, right? You know, we don't necessarily get through. Sometimes we're helping people get unstuck at a certain phase. And uh, in, the, in that particular situation, the approach we took was helping them sort of understand their evidence, um, sense make their evidence, and then sort of, um, play it back to people internally, basically. Now, that doesn't mean, and also, you know, the direction we wanted to take it was, you know, to make it nice and snazzy kind of thing, because people internally want to read nice stuff as well, right, you know? Um, now, we are working on sort of our impact, and that's very much a live question, and how people respond to those. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we feel that it's a tool that, you know, will have, a, you know, we can apply to a wider, Kind of thing, and you know, who knows? You know, hopefully, we will be able to sort of create public versions that you know are more accessible and sort of can help people uh, kind of enjoy reading policy rather than sort of like you know have to read it when something happens. Like you know, um, yeah. That is probably all we've got time for. So, join me in saying thank you to Brendan. <laughs> all right. Before you all go, a reminder that today is First Friday, which means that from 5 to 6 p.m., we invite you to join us here in the studio for a drink and a chat and to see some of the work that our community are making. This month, First Friday coincides with the opening of the Bristol Light Festival, so we'll have a bunch of work on show that incorporates light in playful and unexpected ways. Uh, if you want to stick around in Hot Desk today, find out more about what we do, then please come find one of the studio team. We'll be happy to help. Studio team, give a wave. I'm doing it without even being asked. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, drop us a line on studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions. Thank you all for being here today, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>